Taylor speaking. Um, I'm sure if any of you have read the book that supplied your interest is probably roused as well as to what she's going to be talking about. Um, so she'll be talking to us today about where working with the inspiration of John Wernham can lead you. So can we welcome Valerie. Well, good afternoon. Um, I know a few of you here, not very many, um, but my background is that of first year at the BCNO, followed by three years at the ESO in the first group that went there. Harold Klug, who's here, was in the fourth year at the ESO, and that Heidi Cram and her husband were in the last year before we moved down. So there's a bit of history here as well. So I'd like us to um, reflect back a little bit on what happened uh, yesterday and to look at the journey that we've all taken to actually be osteopaths as we are today. And I think to understand our roots and to un understand our heritage is vital to see where we came from and actually where are we going today. How can we meet this new generation of patients who are coming up to meet us? And how of people of my generation can actually hand over to the new generation of practitioners the gifts we gained so that they can take up the um, baton and go on to inspire the next generation. So I'm looking at the philosophy, I'm looking at the barefoot practitioners in a sense that Still and his um, father are described as, how they, they walk the land and the patients, in a sense, found them, and they found their patients. We look at what lay behind it. They had a, a philosophy of service. There wasn't a philosophy of need or greed. There was a philosophy of um, how to give what was needed. And, in a sense, came out of that lecture too, the need for space and the need for rhythm to restore what had been lost. And so again, with those two ideas of space and rhythm, how can we create that now, and what's our journey through that? I'd like us to look at um, a little section of, of my life, which is my time with John Wernham. Um, <clears throat> I joined the BCNO because I didn't just want the osteopathy at the BSO. I wanted to look at this other side. What is it in the, the human being that makes things go astray through diet, through nutrition, through other aspects without just the bony side? So for us, that was a whole area that was taking us out of our comfort zones. We were asked to experiment with diets. We were asked to experiment with hydrotherapy. So we were going into the unknown and finding out through experience the effects that this had on us. Our first day at, uh, at college at the BCNO, we were asked to sort of strip off our clothes down to brown pants with a you know, room full of people and just get on with it, to just experience what it's like. Um, and again, there's nothing like that to take you out of your comfort zone on day one of being at college. Um, yet we were really asked not just to um, experience what was happening to us, but to be able to feel, and in the lecture um, today, this importance of touch and how we can um, initiate that touch and what impulse we put in with it and how does that affect us and how does that affect the people we work with. So when we moved from the BSO and B BNOA and became ESO, um, Wernham, John Wernham opened his premises to us and we, 12 in my year, 2 in the year above and 6 I believe in Harold's year, um, descended on John Wernham and his building down there and we became the new ESO. Um, we were lucky, we had lots of very valuable lecturers. All of them um, were in the old-fashioned style in a sense, except for Tom Dummer and Robert Lever, who were very much into um, specific um, adjustments at that time. For us, cranial wasn't um, apparent. It was something that we were hearing about and beginning to investigate. So we had people like Peter Blargrave. Um, at the BCNO, we had Keith Blargrave, who was Peter's father, 
who used to arrive on his motorbike and uh, uh, his passion was feet. So we had something to wake us up to the mystery of the foot in Peter Blago's father Keith. Then we worked with people like Robin Kirk and Stephen Peary and again the naturopathic background was very strong. So for us to leave that behind and come to just the osteopathic was a loss but also we were used to um, asking questions and going out of our comfort zone. So to be met by John Wernham was another opportunity. And for us as students, it wasn't always so easy to understand really what John Wernham was bringing us because he was a good practitioner, but for him to speak to us wasn't always so easy for him. And so um, some of us, not all of us, but some of us knew that what we saw was worth fighting for. And so we made very strong efforts to really get to know him and to work with him and understand him. And out of that, the gifts truly came. And I felt very honored because I, I worked um, with him, I treated him, he treated me, I worked in his clinic, we discussed many things. Um, for me, I felt I learned by osmosis. I could sit in his surgery and just watch him move. <clears throat> and he was like poetry in motion. He was a cantankerous old so-and-so and could really put the backs up a lot of people. And I think anybody who knew him would say that's honestly true. But if you took the effort to get to know him, the gifts were there and he would speak to you like an equal and he was um, really thrilled that some people would really learn his, his way, his pathway and his heritage. And so I feel what we learned, we felt almost like the great-grandchildren, from Still to Little John to Wernham and then to us. And we really felt that that was how we were learning, at the foot of this heritage trail. And so when I used to work on John Wernham, he would say to me the things, you know, that would be worrying him about osteopathy of that day. And one of the things you have to think about is it's like a snapshot of four years in the 1973 to 19, 1974 to 1978, of that era. He was worried about um, the lack of, of time um, practitioners in general were spending with patients. Um, he was worried about the actual quality of the time they were. At that time we had clinic masters who were in amongst the chiropractors encouraging them to have six rooms, employ a couple of masseurs to loosen up patients and then to have patients every 10 minutes and the practitioner would go click, 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 click and that was what was happening. And of course the temptation for the osteopaths to sort of think about that was there but there was a great resistance to it also. Um, because it wasn't our way. How could you really prepare um, the, the soil of the patient, if you like, uh, properly in that kind of environment? Um, two, later on, we had the good work of the cranial coming in more strongly, and some of the students would um, see it as one or the other, but John Wern appreciated both but wished for us to be able to really understand what he was trying to bring as well as understand the cranial and really hold them and feel that they were both very valid and other techniques too. And he would say, he said to me, I'm not against cranial as people think I am, but we have it, we've worked with it. And I looked in one of your journals, the 1957 one, and there's, a, there's an article by John Wernham, and before it there's an article on cranial work. He said, it's been there all the time. We work with it. And when I touch people, I feel the cranial rhythm. That's part of my diagnosis. And yet, it's not understood. When you're doing the general osteopathic technique, it's not exclusive. Actually, you're touching into the subtle bodies of the person. And that was what John Wernham was working with. 
you could really see his hands when he touched a patient. In one of the pictures, you see him talking to a group of students, yet his hand is still on the patient. And he taught me, he taught me how to listen, to listen with my hands. Some of the things we used to do as students, you'd pluck a hair out of your head and put it on the desk and you'd feel it with your eyes closed. And then you'd take a piece of paper and you'd feel it again and another sheet and feel it again. So we just spent hours and hours and hours training our fingers to really feel. What we wanted to do was not put ourselves into the patient, but have our hands as listening ears, as tools, such that the patient could come to us and you could read then more than that was obvious. It wasn't just the temperature of the skin, the texture of the tissues, it was as though there was something subtle that was coming towards you, which actually was going to lead you on a journey through that patient. The other gift that John Worm gave me was this gift of looking for space and the space within the joints. And his journey through that space was the general osteopathic technique. Um, but yet, when I saw him work, he didn't spend a long, long time on working with individual joints in the extremities. Yet when I worked on him, he asked me to do that. And so every single joint I would um, articulate, put it through its motions. And uh, every single joint of the hand, every single joint of the foot, and going all over. Again, not general, as the um, gentleman who described still, just putting your hands up and down isn't doing anything. But specifically and diagnostically and listening, such that you could see where was the holding, how were those cuneiforms really working, how was the interrelationship of those small bones in the hand, the small bones in the foot, how is that really working? And then through that, you began to see that this long lever technique that we work with isn't just us taking the arm or the leg as the long lever and working in that way. That's just part of the story. But what about the lever itself? It's not just the long bones. There's a hand or a foot at the end of it. And what, what influence does that have on the body? So again, in one of the... Um, in the book Osteopathic Technique, round volume one, round about page 70, you've got where Wernham speaks of centre and periphery, periphery and centre. And we know it when we say, is it um, a bony lesion that is affecting the um, internal organs? Is it something to do with the internal organs that is affecting the bony lesion? But take it out even further, what about through the limbs? How is that affecting the internal structure? We look quite clearly, our last lecture at the end was just lovely to hear you say, and the foot, what was it about the foot and the manipulation of the foot that is causing these problems or that could aid in the cure? So then you look again and see what's happening in there. We look in the foot, you've got these many bones, you've got a transverse arch and you've got um, the the other, we've got the two arches going in different directions. You look at the shapes of the bones. You can, if you articulate through all of that, it's almost like playing a musical instrument. And this was what Wernham wanted. He didn't want you to put your hands on something and to move it in a mechanistic way. You needed to learn techniques, but you needed to bring it into artistry. And that's what he was when he worked. And it's what I mean by poetry in motion. It's almost as though he would play that foot like an instrument or the spine or, or the hand. Wherever he was, there was this musicality. And so he was asking us as individuals to find that music. Not impose my music on the patient who comes to me, but to listen such that I can feel their music that they can't even hear, such that I can then reawake it for the patient and so that patient can begin to hear it, find their own rhythm, and then get that working again, such that their own healing forces can take over, and then, with your help, that begins to re-establish health within the body.
So this is what we were working with. And you look and see of, um, if you begin to have this more breathing element in the feet, then whenever you're walking, you can really see how the impact of each step is going to affect your knees, your hips, your spine. The same with your hands. If you have stiff hands, how you move is going to be completely different. Can you just let your hands be free a moment, just take them off, and just put tension in this part of your hands, and then move them backwards and forwards. Feel the effect on you, let it go, and then just move normally. You can feel the difference in your spine as to how you move. So therefore the periphery has a profound effect on what's happening in the body itself, particularly the, um, the, the, the vertebral articulations. So Wernham was very clear, to me anyway, that to just use the long levers was part of the story, but to do a lot of work on freeing up the whole of the little bones in the hands, little bones in the feet, was part of it. This is like the breathing area. If this is too tight in both the um, carpus and tarsus, then you've got a problem. So if you're going to work on those, the effect you have is almost like a breathing out. It's as though through life we become, it's like an indrawn breath from various life circumstances and our bones, muscle, tissues hold that. How can we let it go? How can we let it breathe out? And through working on the periphery, you have this capacity to re-enter places that you've not been in for a while. And if you take the trouble to go through somebody's hand, somebody's foot, um, the response you will get is it, it feels lighter, it feels um, more alive, it feels, I know it, I can enter into those spaces. And so this was part of, of my story with Wernham to take me where I've come today to really investigate um, re-enlivening these forgotten parts of us such that the physiology then can change. So by working with the periphery, however I move my arm, it will affect my ribs, it will affect my vertebra, it will then affect everything coming out from there. Whenever I take a step, it's the same thing. So really, what can I do then as the osteopath to help the patient take advantage of that? Because in one sense, we can create the spaces, but then what? Do we then um, leave the patient? Um, how can they fill those spaces? How can they own them? How can they not recreate a lesion, which sometimes can happen? And so that, again, is, is part of the journey, what to do with those spaces. So for me, it was really important to um, give somebody the opportunity to actively be part of the process. So um, part of that expression is to give them the opportunity to get to know parts of them that they're not working with. So through movement in different ways, you have that possibility of doing that. You could see um, from the gentleman this morning how if you move in certain ways, then you can tell whether you're moving so far this way or that way. The other side of that is he spoke about the muscular possibilities, how they, they allow things to work or they don't. Um, if you look at this sense of periphery and, and center, and you work to free that periphery, the effect on the center is quite profound. You can move your shoulders from here, and I can, without scrunching them up, I can do a, a movement like this, and my head has so much movement. If I come from, say, my wrists, I can move in that way. I've got more leverage, in a sense, to help me. If I move from beyond the periphery, my concentration is out here. And what I'm doing is I'm allowing the bones with the muscles to softly go with the movement. So I think part of our work is an educational one, is how to use these muscles 
such that you are allowing movement. When you're working with the arms, are you somebody who lifts up to go on a typewriter? Or are you somebody who comes from underneath and let your hands drop? The, the difference is there. What I'd like you to do is a little bit of motion. I'd like you just to stand up and if there's somebody next to you, I know you've sat down for a long time, but can I borrow somebody? May I borrow you? Thank you. Right. <coughs> Sorry. You could get back without tripping up. <laughs> Hand back. Okay. okay. Right. What I'd like you to do simply is to put your if you stand around the back, sorry, yeah, like this, but I'll do it from the front so you can see what I want, is just to ask your person, just normally, just to bring your hands out to the side and then let them come down. Now the second time, I want you to imagine that you're tying strings around the fingers and so your concentration is on the strings. So if I take hold of the strings and pull the strings, and then let the string come down. Can you see that her concentration is on the peripheral movement? So my question is, is it the same or is it different? So if I have threads on both sides and I pull them out to the side and I come down. Right, if you just feel that on me, you'll see what I'm meaning. From the, the middle to here. And my, that's my degree of turning. And when I come the other way, and that's my degree of turning. Is it the same or is it different? It's different. It's different, yeah. So please just experiment with just a normal moving like this and then play with this idea of strings pulling you from the periphery and see if you have the same amount of movement or if you have different movement. So really let him attach the strings and really go through the imagination of attaching them and the imagination of, of their partner pulling them. So you're really part of the process. But if you just let, let her come up to here, that's right, just, just to there. And, um, Okay. I didn't notice actually, but so I wasn't paying attention. Then you need your hands on her shoulders. Ah, right. you, you put your hands on mine. Okay, so here. Yes. Do you see it for me? Okay, yeah. Okay, so we're doing the last Okay, and the second thing you're doing is see if you're going to put your hands on your typewriter. Let your hands come up onto it and see how that is. Then let your hands come from underneath and rest and see how that is. So, again, put your hands on my shoulders. The first one, just put your hands on. And second one, yeah? Big difference, yeah? Yeah, okay. Sorry? You put your hands on my shoulders. Okay, so normally if I'm putting my hands on or if I'm coming from underneath, let me just try. Can you feel the difference? So either you're putting your hands on a computer to make it yeah. work, yeah. or I'm coming from underneath, such that I can make my hands work but without putting the tension in the muscles. Right. Okay, if you'd like to come back to your places now, please. So, 
were you able to feel any difference or were you feeling it was the same? You felt it different? Okay, so what I'm really asking you to do is to look and see how to use the periphery to help with movement such that you allow the bony structures to, um, to create space one after the other and so the body follows the movement properly from the periphery so you're not held in the middle while something is happening uh, and the middle is holding. Um, because the other avenue of, of Wernham, he made quite clear that whenever you were lying on your front he was constantly rocking the pelvis and feeling up and down. When you were on your back he was constantly rocking the leg, turn, turning the foot, feeling. You had this constant motion, this articulation of all these small bones. So, in, in my way, through osteopathic practice, when I would have many, many patients coming who um, something either hadn't worked for with other people or they were just unusual people, I had to throw away the rule book, as I'm sure many of you have had to do, and go back to first principles and say, what is it? Where can I, where do I start? And if my hands were able to listen and I knew where to start my journey, through um, investigating that motion and enabling the, the body to move freely, I could really begin to see where the, the real structural problems were. Something else that cropped up in the last speaker was um, talking about this bending backwards for here. And you can see quite clearly that if your hand motion is not good, then what you do with your hands will lock up the, um, particularly the dorsal vertebra and when you're walking with your feet you will jar going up so in a sense just as in the small bones in the hands and the feet you've got more um, if you like small bone articulations with the ribs in this whole of the thoracic area so if this area isn't able to breathe properly and move and articulate with those ribs as well as the vertebra you're going to put more pressure on the lumbar and more pressure on the cervical. So this whole middle realm needs to be enlivened. And again, how to do that? Um, through touch is so important. If you um, just put your hands on the table and just close your eyes, immediately your hands become listening tools. And because you're osteopath, you know what to feel. You can receive what's coming towards you. And to create that, that silence and to create that space is part of what we're trying to create inside. So again, when you're working with, uh, with people, how can you help them to find their way into these spaces? You taking them out of their known environment. You don't know um, how to improve when you have no consciousness of what is other than your normal. So with your osteopathic treatment, by creating those spaces, you're giving the patient the opportunity to go into their areas which, have been, which are foreign to them. Once you can enter those spaces and feel more life, in those individual joint areas, then you have the possibility of being able to find a way back to it because you've been taken on a journey and then you can do that. So as an osteopathic practitioner, in one of your leaflets I spotted, it says quite clearly, you can see why osteopaths like to see patients early for prevention treatment rather than wait until the lesion condition results in disease and symptoms. So I've taken a lot of these ideas on board and chosen to work partially as a practitioner in an orthodox way and partly going out and building a bridge and meeting people that I wouldn't otherwise have met. A little bit, little bit in the um, tradition of still if you like. Um, and so, um, I've used various unusual um, ways of doing that. One is through working with uh, circus skills. Because there, I'm taking people into peripheral movement, where they will be fearful and apprehensive because they've not done something before.
So if you can help them breathe in and go beyond into whatever they happen to be holding and find a way to be at ease, then you've extended your periphery and that peripheral movement then works inside and begins to um, articulate, oil, enliven, whatever expression you like, the internal part of you. So to me it's very important to actually um, meet, um, meet people in a way they can relate. Um, I've been into, with anger management teams into sync secondary schools in South London um, and you have children who are problem kids but because you've helped them find their inner spaces they suddenly find something in themselves that they've not known before and they feel good and they want to find it again and so for me that's osteopathy through a different medium. Um, in other ways, I take people on a journey through applied anatomy and working with movement in different ways. We work with touch a lot. Um, many of you will remember cat's cradles when you were children. Um, you know, this um, little string that you make different shapes with in your hands. If you do something like that, you're integrating left and right. You're making the two sides of you work as a team. If you play a flute, anything like that. But do this cat's cradle with your eyes closed. And even just close your eyes now and imagine that you're making something quite complicated shape with those fingers. And when you have your eyes closed, it brings you more into that periphery than you do with your eyes open. So there's a lot we can do with actually making our hands themselves touch in a way that's out of our comfort zone because then we actually penetrate through our limbs to feel such that we then um, own these limbs more and as we own them the tensions soften and we are be able to um, enliven our own vertebra which in a sense then is you improve the function you improve the structure so both things work so all I ask of you now, as I bring this to a close, this is just a little taster, is to look at what's coming towards you now. You have patients who are of a different generation, where there's a lot more um, act-react, a lot more technology, where there's not so much um, what I would call middle realm activity. You don't grind so much, you don't use rolling pins. When we were children, you had all these activities. Nowadays, it's not so common. But if you don't have these activities through the limbs, then you will um, have a, a more static effect on the spine itself. So I would encourage you to find rhythmic activities through your limbs to enliven um, the upper part of you. I would encourage you to take your shoes off, um, to pick marbles up, to play around with your feet, to really enliven those bones in your feet and get them working such that your periphery is awakening up this center. You've got Patients will come to you who will have had drug pasts and the effects that has on them. It's something that is not so much spoken of, but it, it's a reality. I've worked a lot with drug people in the past and having to help them back to as much health as they can, even if it's towards a healthier death, if it's a, a difficult um, drug history. So look at the children you have now too and the life they're coming into and how can you help recreate motion and recreate health through motion. And this is what Wernham brought. He brought structure, governs function, but he brought this motion, creating space as a gift for us to carry on for the next generations. And I think as a gift to Wernham today, um, it's like handing over the like a relay race. I'll be 58 shortly and it's my turn in a sense to inspire the younger ones of you to take that up, to find your pathway and so it won't be lost. So I'll stop there but thank you very much for listening. Thank you.